I am a Yank in Sussex. During our trip to southwest England in October 2022, we spent an entire week in Cornwall. This is part two of that visit. A link to part one can be found in the description or the notification above. But before I go any further, please allow me to say that if you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please do, and set the notification bell to let you know when I post videos. After our visit to St. Maws and Truro, described in part one, we headed off southwestwards towards the little village of Nansagolan, where our Airbnb was located. From there, we radiated out to the more southern parts of Cornwall. We had maps, both Ordnance Survey and a Phillips Road Atlas, but decided instead to ignore them and follow the guidance from the satnav or GPS device. This is because Nansagolan is a very small village, and road signs wouldn't give us good indications until we got quite close. That went fine, but as we got closer to the village, the satnav decided to take us down some very narrow country roads. But the route it chose wasn't all narrow country roads. In fact, only some of the journey, once we turned off the main road, was like that. The rest of the time it was like this. Though there were times when we did wonder if the device was misleading us. Past experiences left that as a possibility. But ultimately, we made it. It was a little difficult to find our Airbnb, but it didn't take all that long. It was right next to what I took at first to be the village church, but it turned out it was the former church, now turned into the village hall or community center. After arriving in Nansagolan in the early afternoon, we unpacked and rested up for the rest of the day. I took my drone out for some aerial views of the area, but as sundown was fast approaching, I didn't have a lot of time for it. So here I combine that day's footage with another couple of flights I took in the coming days, as the weather permitted. I do have to say that except for the first day at Nansigol and the weather was never ideal for drone flights. On one day that I had the drone up, it was kind of iffy about being able to get the drone to fly back to me against the headwind we had at the time. The village of Nansigolan is quite small. As it is part of a larger district, coming up with a count of the inhabitants of, the, of just this village is somewhat un impractical. The civil parish of Crowan, which Nensagolan is a part of, consists of 16 villages and hamlets and has about 2,500 people within its boundaries. Counting the number of habitations in the village, and there seems to be about 100 within a mile of the village hall, and if I were to average out the homes as three persons per household, I'd guess the village to have about 300 residents. As I said, the village hall used to be a church, and the old churchyard still contains graves. The village hall was originally a Methodist chapel, built in 1859, but it closed in 1986. In order to protect the building and the cemetery that surrounds it, local villagers were able to purchase the hall through grants and bursaries. It officially opened as a village hall in 1997. The facility sponsors a number of events every week and month, and since it was right next to our Airbnb, I took advantage of the weekly community cafe that's held every Thursday from 10 a.m. They provide hot food and drinks, a warm welcome space, games, puzzles, books, free parking, free Wi-Fi, and accessible toilets, and the opportunity to meet with friends or make new ones. That's a quote from the website. So I went for a visit on the day, and though I didn't take any photos during the event, this one here is posted on the Village Hall's website, and the event looks just like the one I attended. It had a very friendly atmosphere, and I got a chance to have conversations with a number of villagers though not everyone there actually lived in Nansigolan. Many came from one of the surrounding villages. I even recognized in this photo a couple of the folks I met. The village name, of course, originates in the Cornish language and consists of two words, Nans and Igolan. Nans means valley, and Igolan means whetstone. So it's Whetstone Valley, or Valley of the Whetstones. And just in case you were unaware, here is a picture of a whetstone. And this is what it is used for, which is sharpening cutting tools. You may be aware that some whetstones use water for lubrication while sharpening knives and so on, but the wet, W-H-E-T, part of the word whetstone, does not refer to wet, W-E-T, as in water. It comes from an old Proto-Germanic word that means sharpen. We use the word rarely nowadays in its old meaning, but you may have heard the phrase, this will wet your appetite meaning this will sharpen your appetite. It used to be pronounced wet, with that little unvoiced huh at the beginning. 
Okay, enough linguistics. Now, why this place is called Whetstone Valley is anyone's guess. I wasn't able to find an authoritative reason why, and nobody in the village I spoke to had any idea, but perhaps it was a local industry in the distant past, where people in the surrounding communities brought or sent their knives, scythes, or other cutting implements to be sharpened. Only a couple of hundred feet from the village hall, you can find a remnant of Cornwall's old mining industry. This chimney and machine house are similar to many such structures found throughout Cornwall. In fact, these structures are so common in Cornwall that they could be pretty much a symbol of Cornwall in their own right. Though there are only about 200 of them left, it has been estimated that at the height of Cornwall's mining industry, there were around 3,000. Copper and tin mining, mainly to produce bronze, were the principal metals mined, and this mining was taking place even back in prehistoric times. The European Bronze Age relied tremendously on Cornish copper and tin, and these products found a market all over Europe, but for various reasons it is not currently economical to mine them here. This chimney and machine house are strong evidence that Nansegolan once had one or more active mines. What function did the machine house have? The most common need in Cornish mining was in dealing with the water table. As the deeper mine shafts were dug, the more water had to be pumped out of them especially those mines that were dug near the sea. Other functions, including powering machinery for crushing ore and moving men and ore between the surface and the depths. There is at least one demonstration machine house in Cornwall, and that is the Mitchell's Shaft Cornish Engine House at East Pool Mine. The site has two preserved beam engines and is part of the Cornwall and West Devon Mining Landscape World Heritage Site. It's owned by the National Trust. Here's a short clip of the engine in operation. This machine is functioning here as a winding engine, which would be used as a lift to move men and materials up and down from the depths. These steam engines were of a particular type, and that type was actually named for Cornwall, the Cornish engine. It's a type of steam engine developed here in Cornwall and it's a type of beam engine that uses steam at a higher pressure than the earlier engines developed by the famous engineer James Watt. Our first expedition out of Nansegolan was to the town of Porthleven, not far from Helston. With its obvious Cornish name, I had to know what it translated into in English. It turns out that there are a lot of towns in Cornwall with Porth in their names, and this means cove, landing place, or entrance. Fair enough, because Porth Leaven is in fact a cove. The second element, leaven, means smooth, which my Cornish place name dictionary says was probably the former name of the stream that flows into the cove. The place name dictionary mentions another theory, that the leaven pertains to St. Elwyn, to whom a nearby no longer existent chapel was dedicated, but says that there's no historic documentation to support this. So your guess is as good as mine. Port Levin has a nicely sheltered harbor, enhanced by an outer and an inner seawall. We arrived just as the tide was coming in, so it seemed like a good opportunity to video the event. Accordingly, we sat on a stone bench facing the inner harbor and spent a good 17 minutes watching and recording it. Here I've sped this up to only take 34 seconds. It appears that the tide is pulsing in rather than coming in smoothly, but I think that's just an artifact of the normal wave action. Here it is with the tide mostly in, with most of the boats floated. It was around this time that some of the boats began to be manned for the purpose of heading out. Obviously, most of the watercraft here are for pleasure or fishing. Or both, of course, since to some people fishing is a pleasure. For others, it's just work. Guarding the harbor are two old cannons, one perched on each side of the seawall dividing the cove from the outer harbor. You'll note that there are two seawalls, the outer one being quite a bit wider than the inner one. Since the cove curls around anti-clockwise when looked at from above, the whole arrangement makes the inner harbor quite well protected from severe weather. More about that severe weather in a bit. 
Here you can see boats heading out from the inner harbor and other boats heading in. The ones heading out we had observed being floated by the rising tide, but the ones heading in clearly had to have been out already. These must have motored out before the previous low tide had beached them in the harbor. Since the time between high tides is around 12 hours, it seems that these must have headed out of the port, in this case around 3 a.m. Now that is some dedication when it comes to fishing, if I'm correct about the timing, which I might not be. The large boat that you see here heading out with about seven passengers is a charter fishing boat called the Poseidon. I looked it up. On the day we were in Port Levin, we had fairly decent weather. As you can see, the view from Port Levin Pier was quite nice and the water was fairly calm. There were boats going in and out, people fishing from the pier, and some very nice but not very violent waves were coming off the English Channel. The sea here is still part of the English Channel, but while one might expect that France is the land directly across from here, if you could keep traveling straight past the end of the pier, you wouldn't run into France. If you look straight along the pier, which looks to the southwest in that direction, it's quite far to the next bit of land. Namely, it's about 4,400 miles to the Caribbean coast of Venezuela in South America. This quiet cove is not always this calm, however. During storms, the sea can really come pounding in, and it can become a most dangerous port. Especially dangerous is Port Levin Pier, something that is signposted most prominently. More than one person has lost their life daring the sea here, even just on land. One particularly sad event occurred in a storm in 1978 when two police constables and their patrol car were swept into the sea from here by a huge wave. There's a memorial to them on the western side of the port wall. Contrast the conditions on the day of our visit here with the conditions that sometimes occur during a heavy storm. It would really be something to watch in person. From a safe place, that is. <laughs> now, Port Levin in general is a really neat little town, and there's plenty to talk about. In the interest of time, however, I'll mention just two buildings that I noticed. The first one is this one, with the murals. It's now the Shipwreck Center Museum, but when it was first built in 1894, it was a Royal National Lifeboat Institution lifeboat base. It was closed in 1929 and its slipway removed because the RNLI was able to station motor lifeboats at two other locations, making this one redundant. We didn't have time to visit the museum, unfortunately. The other is Port Levin's most recognizable building, called the Bickford Smith Institute. It's next to the pier and harbor entrance and was built on the site of an old pub, the Fisherman's Arms, and was opened on 16 December 1884. The clock tower on the west corner is 70 feet or 21 meters high. The building currently houses the town council and a snooker club. At first, because of the tower, I took the building to be a church, but seeing the clock put that idea to rest. I feel the building is noteworthy because of its origin, as the Port Levin Literary Institute. It was a gift to Port Levin from Mr. Bickford Smith, a former member of Parliament. The purpose was for the furthering of scientific knowledge and literacy. Today, of course, it bears the name of its builder. Not far from Port Levin's harbor, just a short distance down the beach, within Port Levin Cliffs SSSI, or special site of scientific interest, lies a very unusual rock. It's called the Giant's Rock. It's unusual in being of a rock type called gneiss. I think that's how you pronounce it. A type which is not found in Cornwall. So how did it get there? It's unshiftable by normal natural means. Even the huge storm of 1989 failed the budget. The ancients recognized that it was out of place and had no other explanation to offer other than to say that it must have been brought here by a giant. Hence its name, the Giant's Rock. But why would a giant want to carry this rock anywhere? A good question. The best modern explanation for it is that it is a glacial erratic that arrived after being carved out of some place in Scotland, Norway, Iceland, or Greenland and carried by an iceberg long, long time ago. And after landing here, the iceberg melted and dropped the rock. 
except that when icebergs were prevalent this far south during the last glaciation several thousand years ago, sea level was much lower, and glaciers came nowhere near Port Levin. It's an interesting mystery, to be sure. Well, anyway, after a lovely wander down the harbor, we hit the road and headed back to Nancy Golan. This has been a production of A Yank in Sussex. If you've enjoyed the video, please hit the like button. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe or follow. Thanks for watching, and may you have a very nice day.